you, Chris, for the very nice introduction. And thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and uh, tell you guys about the Dune Detector. So let me start off with a quote by Michelson in 1903, who said, the more important fundamental laws and facts of physical sciences have all been discovered. And of course, in 1903, he had every reason to feel that way. We went from 400 BC, when we thought the earth was made of the four elements, to 1870, when we had discovered the entire periodic table. Fortunately, he was wrong. And in 1910, we actually discovered that elements in the periodic table are made of subparticles that are atoms. And then we discovered that atoms actually have nuclei, and these nuclei are surrounded by orbiting electrons. Then in 1930 to 1960, we discovered that even these nuclei are made of subparticles called protons and neutrons, and that even protons and neutrons have subconstituents, which we know today as quarks. So today, these quarks, which are the six particles you see in purple here, make up a part of our standard model of particle physics. And in addition to the quarks, we have what are known as leptons. So the electron, which was the guy orbiting the nuclei, was our original lepton. But since then, we found its partner particles, namely the muon, the tau, as well as the neutrinos. Our understanding of the fundamental forces that govern the universe also underwent a dramatic transformation. So in the 1660s, we already knew about gravity. In the 1860s, we knew about the electromagnetic force, or light. And then in the 1970s, we discovered there's something called a strong force, which is actually responsible for keeping quarks tied within the proton and the neutron. And we also discovered the weak force, which is responsible for interactions that happen within the sun. We also found out that each of these forces has an associated particle that carries the force. So the gluon is responsible for the strong force, the photon for the electromagnetic force, and the Z and W boson for the weak force. So we put all these things together into what is today known as the model of standard, the standard model of particle physics. And it describes how all the particles, not all, almost all the particles and forces um, interact. So we have, as I mentioned, the quarks, we have the leptons, namely the electron, muon, and tau. We have neutrinos, and each lepton has its partner neutrino. So we have an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino. We have the force carriers that I just described. And in 2012, we discovered the Higgs boson uh, with the Atlas and CMS detector, for which the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2013. Now, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the neutrinos. And this is because the neutrinos are a very special particle in the standard model that don't quite fit in. So neutrinos, according to the standard model, are massless particles. And they interact via the weak force. That means their interactions are mediated by these W and Z bosons here. Now, where can we find neutrinos typically? Well, we find them when nuclei fuse together, such as interaction in the sun's core or supernova events. We also find them in cosmic rays. When a proton from space hits the atmosphere, it shatters into a bunch of other particles and the resulting neutrinos eventually make it to Earth. We also find neutrinos when nuclei break apart, so in nuclear power plants, for example, and in remnants from interactions that happened in the Big Bang Theory. There are about 100 trillion neutrinos that pass through your body every second. And you might be wondering, if this is the case, why can't I feel them? Well, the reason you can't feel them is because this weak force that mediates their interaction is very weak compared to the other forces. So for example, if we have a three mega electrovolt neutrino produced in the sun, it will travel 53 light years before even interacting in substances like water. Now, if you compare this to another elementary particle, the electron, or its antiparticle, the positron, whose interactions are mediated by the electromagnetic force, or the photon, this particle will travel if it was created in the sun only three centimeters before interacting. So this gives you an idea of how much weaker the weak force is compared to all our other forces. So this means that to see these very weakly interacting particles, we either need a lot of neutrinos or a large detector. So you might be wondering, you know, given this, how do we even go about detecting them? And actually the guy who originally postulated a neutrino, Wolfgang Pauli, was concerned with the exact same problem, so much so that he said, I have done a terrible thing. I have postulated a particle that cannot be detected. 
So you might be asking yourself if, you know, if you can't detect a particle, what's the point of postulating it? Well, he did so to resolve a very common problem. So when people came up with the periodic table, they noticed that when elements decay from one element to another, what is actually happening is the neutron is converted to a proton as well as an electron. And they measured the outgoing energy of the electron. Now, if you repeat this experiment, you would think if energy is conserved before and after the decay, the electron is always going to have the same energy. But this wasn't the case. They noticed that every time they performed the experiment, the electron for some reason came out with a different energy. So the way that Pauli explained this was there was an invisible particle that we can't detect and it carries away some of the energy from these nuclear decays, meaning it shares some of its energy with the electron. So sometimes the electron sees more energy, sometimes it sees less, depending on how much this invisible particle, which later came to be known as the neutrino, carries away. So it wasn't until 1956, so 26 years after the neutrino existence was postulated that we actually detected it. So I said that nuclear power plants are a source of neutrinos, namely electron antineutrinos. And what Cohen and his collaborator did was they basically put a one ton water detector beside the nuclear power plant. And then he waited for neutrinos to interact with the proton that was inside the atom of the water. When the neutrino interacted with the proton, it created a neutron and an electron. After that, this electron very quickly, or sorry, positron, which is just an electron with opposite charge, it very quickly combined with an electron that is inside the water. And this combination of positron and electron forms two photons, which is basically a flash of light. And then all he had to do was detect the neutron. How did he detect the neutron? Well, in this water, he dissolved a lot of cadmium. And cadmium nucleus likes to absorb neutrons. And when the neutron was absorbed by the cadmium nucleus, another photon, so another flash of light was detected. And this flash of light was also detected by the photomultiplier tubes that were around the detector. And so through observing two coincident flashes of light, he basically, with his collaborator, proved that these electron antineutrinos come, exist and come from power plants. Now here I've showed you one example of how a detector actually uh, detects a neutrino. So I'm not going to show you any more examples of this because the rest are quite similar. They involve similar interactions. And as you'll see throughout the talk, uh, we basically did very similar things. We just increased our tubs of water. So now that we know that the neutrino exists, according to the standard model, it should also be created in the core of the sun. So the standard solar model exactly predicts how neutrinos are created in the sun. So this plot shows the flux of neutrinos we expect from the sun as a function of the neutrino energy. The different colors basically just corresponds to different type of chain and um, reactions that happen within the sun's core. But the main thing to remember is that the sun primarily produces an electron neutrino. So um, in 1969, an experiment called the Homestake Experiment in the South Dakota mine, which was basically a giant tank of dry cleaning fluid, was made to detect the electron uh, neutrinos coming from the sun. The problem was it only detected one third of the electrons that are predicted by the standard solar model, which was very puzzling. And several experiments after that confirmed its result. So this mystery was resolved in 2001 when a detector of snow, which was basically a heavy water tank in Canada in a mine, measured the solar neutrinos. So this tank was also surrounded by photomultiplier tubes, this time a bit more advanced than what was used in the 1960s. And it measured this green spectrum, this what we call boron-8 spectrum of neutrinos from the sun. The reason we call it boron-8 is basically because it requires the boron-8 element decaying to beryllium, an electron, and an electron neutrino. Now, because this snow detector used heavy water, it was the first experiment that could not only detect the electron neutrino, but also the total flux of all the different flavor of neutrinos, so the electron, 
muon and tau neutrinos. And what it found was that the total flux of the different neutrinos is consistent with what our predictions of the standard model. But it seems that not all the electron neutrinos get to Earth. So this was a puzzling result. So what, what could this mean? So one thing that this could mean is, for example, if electron neutrinos are created in the sun, and as they're traveling toward the Earth, they actually oscillate into different types of other neutrinos. So they change into a muon and a tau neutrino. So when they come to Earth, we still measure the same total flux that the sun sent us, but only one third of the electron neutrinos because the other two are muons or taus, which at that time we weren't able to detect. So fortunately, we can dust off an old theory that exactly predicts that neutrinos oscillate into one another. And this was a theory predicted in 1957 by Ponte Corvo and refined in 1962 by Maki, Nakagawa, and Sakata. And they basically used what is called the PMNS matrix to describe how neutrinos oscillate or change flavors between each other. This oscillation mathematically also implies that neutrinos have to have mass. So this is great because it's a solution to the solar neutrino mystery, but it's very bad news for the standard model because if you remember, the standard model requires that our neutrinos be massless. Now, I should mention one other thing that added to the confirmation that neutrinos indeed oscillate to each other. And this evidence came even two years before the Snow experiment. So I said we have neutrinos coming from the atmosphere. And this happens when a proton hits our atmosphere and then it decays into these particles called pions and, and kaons. And then those pions and kaons turn into muon and muon neutrinos. So our atmosphere is mostly full of muon neutrinos. So another heavy water tank named Super Kamiya Kondei, this time located in Japan, measured atmospheric neutrinos coming from above the detector, so directly from the sky, but also from below the detector. So neutrinos that had already passed through the Earth. And what this detector noticed, of which you can see a picture of the inside here, is that the neutrinos that came from the up direction matched our standard model predictions. But the neutrinos that came from the downward direction that also had to pass through the entire Earth showed a deficit with respect to our standard model prediction. And this was because the neutrinos that went through the Earth traveled a lot longer. So they had in that time actually oscillated to the other types of neutrinos. So this evidence combined with evidence of the solar neutrino oscillations gave us definite confirmation that neutrinos really oscillate into each other, which implied they had a mass. And this won the 2015 Nobel Prize for the Super Kamiya Konde and Snow experiment together. So I mentioned that the way that neutrino masses, the true neutrinos oscillate are what is described through PMNS matrix. And I also mentioned um, that neutrinos have mass. Now you would think that the neutrino masses directly correspond through these different type of flavor neutrinos so that the electron neutrino has its own mass, the muon neutrino has its own mass, and the tau neutrino has its own mass. But in reality, Mathematically, we can only talk about neutrinos in terms of their flavor stage, which are these guys, and in terms of their mass stage, which are mu1, mu2, and mu3. And it happens that all of the mass states are made of all three flavors of neutrinos. So mu1 mostly has electron neutrinos, but has some of the others as well. The new two mass state mostly has muon neutrinos, but has some of the others. And the new three mass state also mostly has mu tau neutrinos, but also some of the other two. And the relationship between how the flavor and the mass states interact is described by this PMNS matrix and can also help us get the probability of neutrinos oscillating from one flavor to another. So what is actually inside this PMNS matrix? Well, it can be broken up into three parts. And these three parts basically consists of cosines and signs of this theta angle, which we call the mixing angle. And I'll describe what that means in a second. So first focusing on one part of the matrix. This one matrix part describes the solar neutrino mixing. So it describes how the electron neutrinos in the sun oscillate into other neutrinos. 
So from this, we can measure the probability of an electron neutrino oscillating to a muon neutrino, for example. You can see it depends on this mixing, this theta, between the two mass states, this mu1 and mu2. And it also depends on the difference in the mass between the mass states, so this mu1 and mu2. This difference in mass we call the mass splitting. It also depends on the length the neutrino has traveled and the energy of the neutrino. So we know the length the neutrino travels from the sun is about 1.5 times 10 to the 8 kilometers. We can measure the energy in the detector. We can measure this probability of oscillation in our detector. So from the known and measured quantities, we can then infer the coupling as well as this mass splitting. And from solar neutrino measurements, we find that this mass splitting between these two mass states, known as the solar mass splitting, is about 8 times 10 to the negative 5 electron volts. So to give you a graphical representation of what this means, so imagine this here is the probability that an electron neutrino converts to a muon neutrino, and it's described by this blue line as a function of the length the neutrino travels. So if it starts off as an electron neutrino, after it travels about 400 kilometers, it has a very good chance of converting to a muon neutrino. Then after it travels another 800 kilometers, it will most likely with almost 100% probability change back into an electron neutrino, and so on. The red line shows the probability that an electron neutrino will basically survive as an electron neutrino, and it's just the inverse of the blue graph. So this theta, this mixing parameter, and, and this delta m, you can think of it as they control the amplitude and the frequency of the oscillation of the neutrino. So this PMNS matrix has other elements. This part of the PMNS matrix describes how atmospheric neutrinos oscillate. So I said atmospheric neutrinos are mostly this muon flavor, and they oscillate into the tau neutrino. Again, that can be described in terms of this coupling, but this time between these upper mass states, the mu2 and mu3. It also depends on the mass splitting between the upper states. This mass splitting is known as the atmospheric mass splitting. It depends on the length, and a neutrino from the atmosphere travels typically between 10 and 13,000 kilometers. And it depends on the energy of the atmospheric neutrinos, which is typically between 0.2 and 100 GeV. So using the same method as previously, we can again calculate the mass splitting of between the two and three states, which is known as the atmospheric mass splitting. And this is 2.4 times 10 to the negative 3 electron volts squared. And then we have a third element of the matrix. This element describes the mass splitting between the very first neutrino mass state and the third neutrino mass state. And this information we can gain from reactors, which I said are a good source of neutrinos, but as well as neutrino accelerators. And what happens as neutrino accelerators is we basically have a neutrino factory. We make artificial neutrinos, we shoot them through the ground, and then we detect them with a detector. Typically, the energies of neutrinos at reactors are 3 MeV. At accelerators, they're between 20 MeV and 100 GeV. And at both of these types of experiments, we can control the length the neutrinos travel before they oscillate. So at reactors, we typically place detectors between 20 meters and 250 kilometers away from the reactor. And at accelerators, we typically place our detectors around 50 meters to 730 kilometers away from, uh, from the neutrino source. It turns out that this third mass splitting is also very similar to the, to the second one. It's almost the same number. The full theory is a little bit more complicated because the full oscillation probabilities also depend on a lot of interference effects. Um, I just wanted to mention that, but often we can use these two generation approximations. So with that, the, the theory is fine. Okay, so you know now we have a way to explain all these old neutrino mysteries. Um, but as Einstein said, uh, the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. 
So the question is, what don't we know? So I said in the standard model, neutrinos are massless, but we just found out that through experiments, they do have mass. We don't know what the neutrino mass ordering is. We don't know if there's CP violation in the neutrino sector. There's outstanding modern neutrino mysteries that we don't know about. We don't know if neut additional neutrinos might exist beyond the standard model. And we don't know what we can learn about the sun and the universe through studying solar and supernova neutrinos. So now I'm going to try and explain a little bit what each of these questions is and why it's important to answer it. So first, what is the question of the mass hierarchy? So I said that with our methods, we can calculate the splitting between the different mass states of the neutrino. So we can calculate the solar mass splitting and the atmospheric mass splitting, but we can't calculate which comes first. We can't calculate whether the new one mass is heaviest, and this is known as the normal hierarchy, or maybe the new three mass is heaviest, and new one and new two are lighter. This is known as the inverted hierarchy. So this is an outstanding question that future experiments will have to address. Another thing that we don't know is do neutrinos and their antiparticles, antineutrinos, oscillate with the same probability? A fancy way of saying this is, is there charge parity or CP violation in the neutrino sector? And a mathematical way of saying this is, what is the CP violating phase? Which, if you recall our PMNS matrix, is this guy here circled in red. What is this phase? According to recent results from an experiment in Japan, this phase is between negative two degrees and negative 878 degrees, but there's still a lot to learn here. The reason that this question is important is because if neutrinos and antineutrinos don't behave the same, meaning if there is CP violation, this could explain why when we look out into the universe, we see so much more matter than no antimatter. And of course, there's some modern neutrino mysteries which we still have to resolve. So one of them comes to us from what are known, what are called mini Buddha and LSD experiments. These experiments were basically giant tubs of mineral oil and they would receive their neutrino beam from a neutrino factory about 500 meters away. So this is an example of a plot from mini Boon. It measured the process of a muon neutrino going into an electron neutrino. And this is the number of ends it saw as a function of the energy. So the different colors are the different backgrounds that you would expect. And then the data points uh, are what is actually measured. And you can see there's quite a bit of an excess of the data over the background. And when this is combined with LS and D, it actually gives a six sigma excess. There's also what is known as the gallium anomaly. So this was measured by two collaboration, Galax and Sage. And what they basically did was they put a very radioactive source in a shield, in, in uh, basically a tub, and then they put a detector beside it and measured the upcoming neutrinos. They were measuring the probability that an electron neutrino would travel a certain distance and not oscillate, so that it would survive, basically. So on the y-axis is the number of expected events, is the number of the calculated events, and you would expect this to be one. But both collaborations in their recent results measured something a little bit below one, which corresponds to about a three sigma deficit. And finally, there's the reactor anomaly. So I said we can put detectors beside nuclear reactors in order to measure the outcoming neutrinos from the reactors. So, Typically, reactors produce electron antineutrinos, which are these guys here. And again, we're measuring the probability of these types of neutrinos surviving, so the probability that they don't oscillate. So on the y-axis, we have the numbers uh, of neutrinos we would expect as a, number, as a function of the number that we actually observe. So we would think this is one up here. And this is drawn as a function of the length these neutrinos travel from the nuclear reactor to their detector. Now, each data point here actually represents a different experiment. And this is because each of these experiments is placed at a different length away from their respective reactor. And you can see that many different types of detectors placed beside many different types of reactors all show a slight deficit with respect to the expectation which points at a three sigma deficit. Now, again, we don't know the exact reason for this, but 
we can suspect certain things. And one of the possible explanations is that maybe there's an extra neutrino that exists and these excesses and deficits happen because our normal neutrinos are oscillating into this other type of neutrinos we haven't yet uncovered. Now, that's an interesting proposition because, as I said, the standard model doesn't explain neutrino masses. And in order to explain neutrino masses, most theories require the existence of an extra neutrino. And when you look closely, you'll see that across broad energy ranges, so from energies that are relevant to uh, neutrino factories all the way up to energies that are relevant at high energy colliders, there are some small hints of potential extra neutrinos. So if an extra neutrino existed, you could calculate its mass splitting with respect to our standard model neutrinos and plot it as a function of how strongly it couples to the standard model neutrinos, which is this y-axis. So in the blue line are all the experiments, neutrino experiments like LSD and Miniboon that favor the existence of an extra neutrino. And the area inside the blue line is favored at a three sigma level. Now this story is complicated because there's another set of experiments on this side, namely experiments like Ice Cube and Minos. And they actually don't like the existence of an extra neutrino. So they rule out everything outside of these red ellipses. So all this stuff at a three sigma level. So there is some tension between experiments that prefer the existence of extra neutrinos and the ones that don't. I should mention that this tension is slightly alleviated when you assume there's a lot more extra neutrinos. Now, at the very high energy, we also have some evidence of extra neutrinos. So if extra neutrinos do exist, we would expect standard model processes to behave a little bit differently. So namely, currently in the standard model, we assume that lepton flavors are treated the same. If an extra neutrino existed, this would no longer be the case. And this is what is known as lepton universality violation. So this plot is a combination of various accelerator, or collider, and other experiments that show some standard model um, lepton couplings to, different, to, to each other. So the standard model of predictions are in the blue and the white is the data. And you can see they disagree at about a three sigma level. So there's about a three sigma preference for lepton universality violation. There are several other papers that I don't have time to go into that talk about this, but I put them as references here. So how do we go about answering all these neutrino related questions as well as addressing these uh, remaining new neutrino mysteries? Well, as William Deming said, uh, in God we trust, all others must bring data. So we have two big upcoming neutrino accelerators that we think will provide us the data to answer all these questions. One is called Hyperkamia Conde and will be in Japan, and one is called Dune, uh, which will be in the US. Now, before I explain the difference between them, I wanna say one thing. As neutrinos travel from their accelerator, to the detector, it transverses matter in the Earth. Now, matter in the Earth has different effects on neutrinos and their antiparticles, the antineutrinos. And the same is true of CP violation. CP violation, the whole point is exactly that you have different effects on neutrinos and antineutrinos. So the question becomes, if we see neutrinos and antineutrinos behaving differently, how do we know if it's just because of the Earth's matter or if it's because of CP violation. So you can design experiments with two possible strategies in mind to address this question. You can design ex experiments such that when the neutrino is traveling from its source to the detector, it transverses a very small distance, so only 300 kilometers. And on this scale, these matter effects don't matter at all. And this is what Hyperkamia Conde pursues. Or you can use Dune strategy, and this is have a very large path that the neutrinos transverse between their source and the detector. And here the matter effects are significant. But here, the only way to disentangle the effects between the matter and the CP violation is to rely on the fact that these effects are going to be different depending on the incoming neutrino energy. This means that Dune has to make all the measurements as a function of the incoming neutrino energy. So this is, plot is an example of what Dune expects. So this is the probability of a muon neutrino going to an electron neutrino as a function of the neutrino energy. 
If the muon neutrino doesn't oscillate at all, we expect this hashed yellow band. And if it oscillates, we expect these squiggly lines for its first oscillation and its second oscillation. The differences in color just represent the different CP violating phases. So let me now tell you a bit more about DUNE. It's a collaboration that consists of more than 1,000 collaborators from 180 countries and from uh, 30 countries and 180 institutions. And the plan is basically that at Fermilab um, near Chicago, we're going to produce a beam of neutrinos obtained from a very high power proton beam. And then those neutrinos will travel first through a near detector. And this near detector will basically characterize the energy and the intensity of the neutrino beam. Then they're going to travel 1300 kilometers underground back to the Homestake mine in South Dakota, where we'll have a really large far detector that, that is going to try and get at some of these outstanding questions. So how do we produce the original neutrino beam? Well, it, let's go back to the example of cosmic ray muons. Um, remember I said that we have um, atmospheric neutrinos that are produced when a proton hits the atmosphere, and then they're turned into pions and kaons and then they turn into muon and, and muon neutrinos. We basically copy this exact same principle to make artificial neutrinos. So we take some protons from you know, a bottle of hydrogen or something, we smash it into a target. These protons from this smash turn into pions and kaons. We then take a magnet to focus these pions and kaons so that they're going nice and straight. Then we let these pions and kaons decay to muons and muon neutrinos. And finally, we shield the muons. So we stop the muons and we allow the muon neutrinos to pass right through. So our accelerators mostly have muon neutrinos in them. So after the production, I said that first, the neutrinos pass through a near detector. In Dune, the first part of the near detector is going to be what's called a liquid argon time projection chamber. I'll explain that technology in a second. Then it's going to be um, the same thing, but instead of liquid, the, the argon is going to be gas. And the purpose of this component is to study um, the interactions between the neutrinos and the argon in more detail. And then we're going to have some scintillator cubes that is just basically going to monitor the beam. And the mirror detector is important because it's important to characterize what kind of beam we start off with such that we know at the far detector what our original neutrinos actually oscillated to. <coughs> this is what the far detector is going to look like. So imagine we have neutrinos incoming from this direction here. The far detector is basically going to be four giant chambers installed one after another. Each of them is going to be about 10 kiloton fiducial mass. If we zoom in on one of these chambers, um, it's going to be four different chambers separated by different um, basically metal cages. And if we zoom into one of these metal cages, this is what a large time projection chamber actually looks like. So on the one side, we have a cathode plane, or basically a piece of metal. On the other side, we have three different wires that are oriented at different angles towards each other. And across this, we apply an electric field. So idea is when a neutrino comes in, it interacts with the liquid argon that's inside here. In these interactions, electrons are released, so are photons. The electrons travel in the electric field and they induce a signal on these wires. And these wires then create two 2D images from which we can reconstruct a third image. The photons that are released are collected by photomultipliers um, and they can tell us the time at which this neutrino interaction occurred. So we already have a prototype for the Dune detector, and this is right now running on the CERN neutrino platform. So the first part of the photo prototype exists of what's called a single phase technology, and it's this big red tub here. It's about 120th the size of the planned Dune. And the second one is the dual phase technology. It's, it's back up here. The single phase one already took data with some test beam uh, in the fall of 2018. And the dual phase one was completed last year and it's getting ready to take test beam data. Now, what's the difference between these two types of prototypes? 
Well, the first one I already explained, the electrons drift horizontally onto these anode wires. This allows the electrons to drift about 3.6 meters before the signal is degraded. And this design requires very low noise electronics since we don't have any signal amplification in the liquid argon. The other dual phase design is a little bit different. Here, the electrons travel vertically up and then they reach a gaseous stage of the detector. And in this gaseous phase, the signal is actually amplified before it's collected on the metal planes. The advantage for this is that you have much less stringent requirements on how noisy your electronics can be. And you can also allow for a much larger drift time, so six meters instead of just three. And that allows you to build basically much bigger detectors in bigger chunks. So this is a few words about how protodyne has performed so far at CERN. So the very first plot basically shows how we calibrated protodyne using cosmic ray data. So the quantity shown is the charge deposited by cosmic rays as a function of the distance that they traveled. So in the gray, in the red is before the detector was calibrated, and in the black, it's after it's calibrated with the cosmic rays. Then we use this calibration and we apply it to test beam data. So we take a test of a beam of protons and muons and we shoot it at the detector. And then we measure the response, the energy response of the detector, which is on the y axis, as a function of the distance the particle travels. So the response of the detector to the protons that is expected is in the red, and the expected response of the muon is in the blue here, and the data is in the yellow. You can see that the data follows very nicely the expectation in the red and blue. This means that our protodune detector is performing very well and that the fact that it's been calibrated with cosmic muons, um, it, it has provided a very accurate calibration. So our prototype performs well. So we're getting ready to build the actual dune detector. So let me tell you a bit about the dune sensitivity to the different problems we mentioned. So I said we will have sensitivity to both the mass ordering and the CP violation. So I said in dune, the neutrinos will travel 300, 1300 kilometers before getting to the far detector. So there's lots of chances for them to interact with matter. And I also said that matter acts differently on uh, neutrinos and their antiparticles. And this means there's an asymmetry in the probability of muon neutrinos oscillating to electron neutrinos with respect to the same process, but for the antiparticles. So in Dune, we can measure this asymmetry. And it turns out that the sign of the asymmetry depends on the mass ordering. So that's how we get the mass ordering. Now, as I said, this complicates the CP measurement because the whole point of a CP measurement is measuring how antineutrinos and neutrinos behave differently. But again, the fact that the matter effects and the CP violation effects have a different dependence on energy can help us here because Dune um, can get the CP violation as a function of energy. <coughs> So these next plots now show dune sensitivity to the mass ordering and the CP violation. So in dune, we will run according to what's called the staged plan. So we're going to install two modules first, and then we're going to run it at a 1.2 megawatt proton beam. A year later, we'll install another module. Three years later, we'll install the fourth and final module. And six years later, we're going to upgrade the beam to 2.4 megawatts. So on the left, we have the ordering to the, the sensitivity to the mass ordering as a function of the number of years that the detector is running. The green line here shows the sensitivity for regardless of the CP violating phase. Okay, and you can tell we reach the five sigma sensitivity for any value of CP violating phase after about two years of running. So very quickly, we're going to know this outstanding question of the mass hierarchy. The CB violation sensitivity is shown on the right as a function of the number of years running. Again, the green line is shown for about 75% of the CP violating phase. So after about 14 years, we'll have five sigma sensitivity. 
the blue line is shown for 50 values of 50 percent of values of the cp violating phase so if we're lucky and the cp phase takes on a certain value we'll know it after about six years of running i said dune will also have sensitivity to solar neutrinos and you might be asking yourself why do we still care about these well dune can help us further verify the solar model it can also help us measure the core temperature of the sun because these neutrinos are coming directly from the core it can also characterize something called the neutrino floor now what is the neutrino floor this is basically something that is going to help dark matter experiments so on the lower left hand plot you have the probability of a dark matter particle interacting with a detector as a function of the dark matter mass all these different lines are the sensitivities that different dark matter experiments will have in the future and the yellow line are different types of neutrinos so once these dark matter experiments hit the yellow line neutrinos will become an irreducible background for them so their sensitivities will drop a lot so it's important for experiments to characterize these this neutrino floor the first thing that dark matter experiments will hit is exactly this boron 8 neutrino spectrum so that's this guy in green in the in the solar model and this guy can be measured in blue so what this guy will look like in dune is measured by this blue line here there's another set of solar neutrinos called hep solar neutrinos that come from a different reaction and what they look like in dune is shown by the orange here and then the red line represents with what efficiency dune will be able to detect these different types of solar neutrinos with a little bit more strict cuts, the efficiency goes down a little bit as shown by the blue line. I also said Dune will be sensitive to atmospheric and supernova neutrinos. So we can still measure atmospheric neutrinos to extract neutrinos properties or search for beyond the standard model theory. So this is the sensitivity of, to the atmospheric neutrinos as a function of the coupling between, uh, of the mixing angle between two different neutrinos. So in the green is the hyper-K sensitivity. Hyper-K will be a much bigger detector, so it will have a bit better sensitivity. And in the blue is Dune, and Dune is, is quite comparable. And Dune will be sensitive to supernova neutrinos. Now, why do we care about these? Well, you know, when a massive star collapses to a neutron or a black hole, um, we get a huge burst, about 10 to the 58, of low-energy neutrinos that are emitted over the time span of a few seconds. Now, this happens a few times per century, and studying these will help us test astrophysical theories as well as probe new physics, and Dune will be sensitive to these types of interactions. So here we can see the number of events we expect uh, as a function of the time or the duration of the event, and then the blue is what the supernova neutrinos would look like if there were no oscillations, which we know is not the case. The green is for the inverted hierarchy, and the red is for the normal hierarchy. And finally, Dune will have sensitivity to the set extra neutrinos over broad mass ranges. So let's assume these extra neutrinos are going to be very low mass, so 10 to the negative 3 eV. If this is the case, the mass splitting between the extra neutrinos and our standard model neutrinos is going to be in this range between 0.1 and 1 eV. And this is an area that is sort of on the boundary of the LSND and reactor anomalies. And Dune will have good sensitivity here. So this plot is the mass splitting between the extra neutrino and the standard model neutrino as a function of the coupling between our muon and tau neutrinos. So you can see some competing experiments in the different colors here. And Dune is the black line. And you can see for lower mass splittings, Dune really dominates. It will also have um, very good sensitivity to our tau neutrino coupling to extra neutrinos. So this is the coupling of the tau to the extra neutrino as a functioning of the coupling of the muon to the extra neutrino. The current limit is a NOVA result, which is shown in the gray, and Dune will be able to get this, this result shown in the blue. If our extra neutrino is in this energy range, so it's, if it's about an electron volt, here, the oscillation between the light and the extra neutrino is going to be sort of in the median range. And this area is actually preferred by the LSD mini boon anomalies as well as by some reactor anomalies. So again, if we look at the mass splitting as a function of the coupling, 
Dune is shown in the black and everything right of this line is excluded. So you can see Dune will have a really good sensitivity compared to other experiments shown in, in the other colors. And finally, what happens if our extra neutrino is really heavy? So in this case, the mass splitting with the extra normal neutrinos will be very large. You're going to have very fast oscillations. Um, and our best bet here is to look for this extra neutrino with our near detector. So this is the, the coupling of the extra neutrino to the electron neutrino as a function of the mass of the extra neutrino. So you can see many different types of experiments that are going to have access to this area. And Dune is this green one here. So you can see that it'll have quite good compatibility, especially in the lower masses. Okay, so to summarize, uh, Dune is a broadband uh, energy neutrino experiment. We have a prototype made of it here at CERN. It's running smoothly and performing well. Dune is going to have unprecedented sensitivity to the neutrino mass hierarchy, to CP violation, and to searches for extra neutrinos. It is also going to have a rich atmospheric and solar neutrino program that is still under development. The technical design report for the Dune experiment has been completed, and you can reach it here. The construction of the far detector is underway, so you can see a picture here of the excavation down under in the mine. The near side construction is also underway. Um, the far detector is expected to take physics data in late 2020s, and the neutrino beam is expected on a similar time scale. Um, and finally, this year we um, we will start with a per, with a process that that we're, we will specify the exact timeline, and that will be finalized in 2021. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Illich, for the wonderful talk. Are there any questions? Okay, I actually raised my hand. I wasn't sure what we're supposed to do, but. Um, Please go ahead. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, so that was a great talk and I know nothing about neutrinos. So that was awesome. Except every time you said the word flavor, I just want to go get ice cream. Um, I did have a question about how you determine um, like the baselines. So you were talking a bit about the oscillations and I was wondering if the length of the oscillations is like a set thing. Is that like really well constrained so that you know when you have a thousand kilometer um, baseline or whatever for your neutrino to travel through, you know exactly how many oscillations you're gonna get. And so that you should definitely see a neutrino change into a different type of neutrino. Um, yeah, so, so from an experimental point of view, if we're dealing with, um, with, for example, you know, reactor neutrinos or accelerator neutrinos, you can definitely set the length where your neutrinos travel because you basically determine how far you put your detector away from, from, um, you know, from, from your neutrino source. Um, for atmospheric, from solar neutrinos, um, it's a little bit harder to tell, but uh, because we don't know where exactly in the core of the sun, the neutrinos are created. Um, but the distance to the sun is so long that this extra distance to the core doesn't even make that much of a difference. So it's a good approximation. For the atmospheric neutrinos, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, and it's, it's tricky because atmospheric neutrinos go through the detector in all directions. Um, so it's a bit harder to tell exactly how far they've traveled. But based basic on, on what direction they're coming from, we can approximately calculate the angle through which they came and the distance through which they traveled. Um, and then yes, we can also, you know, so, so we do have a quite good idea of how long they have actually traveled. And yeah, from the theory, we can calculate how much we expect them to oscillate based on how much they've traveled. This is like the input to the theory that we put. Um, so if, if, if I go back to the, to the equation here, um, so, uh, let me, sorry, share my screen again. Um, share. Um, so you, you can see from the equations here, so this length we do know pretty well. Um, 
and that's an input, the energy we measure, and that's an input, the probability we measure, and that's an input. And from that, we have to simultaneously determine the coupling and the mass. Um, and this is a little bit trickier because we, we basically have to do fits of different parameters. So this is all based on fits. It's not based on exact, you know, plug and calculate. Um, but okay, it, when we put a bunch of experiments together, we think we have a, we have a good idea of, of the calculated mass splitting and the calculated uh, couplings. Okay, thank you. That was, that was clear. Hi, thanks, for, yeah, please hi, thanks for a very nice talk. I, I wanted to uh, ask you if you could maybe explain the differences between um, Dune and Hyper-K in terms of uh, energy thresholds, particularly for the different types of neutrino interaction and uh, how that plays in terms of uh, detecting neutrinos from the sun or from supernovas and things. Yeah, um, so one of the big differences um, in terms of is in terms of, well, first, to first order, hyper-K is going to be much bigger. Um, so it's expected to have much better sensitivity to things like atmospheric neutrinos and, and um, possibly solar neutrinos just because of its size. Um, now, the, in terms of the types of interactions, the advantage of, so um, hyper-K is, is going to be based on basically photomultiplier tubes and it's going to rely on Cherikov radiation, which is going to be signaled uh, by the incoming neutrino. Um, and the advantages of the reconstruction in Dune is from the liquid argon interactions, you can separate the neutral current and the charged current interactions. So you can roughly separate when neutrinos um, yeah, when, when they interact via the Z or the W boson. And this separation is going to give us sensitivity to certain types of processes um, that hyper-K won't necessarily have. In terms of energy thresholds, uh, so this, this, this depends. Uh, the Dune ones are currently planned to be at around uh, 10 mega electron volts. We think we can get that by playing around with the, the, the data acquisition system to a few electron volts, which would basically give us the advantage of detecting a lot more of the, um, of, of, of the solar neutrino spectrum. Um, the hyper-K ones, I think, are, I, I believe are a little bit above that. I'm not exactly sure how many electron volts far they are away from it, but they're a little bit above it. So it's basically an interplay between how well we can get our reconstruction in Dune to get the lower energy stuff versus how much bigger is Hyper-K to get more of these events. Um, and when you calculate the sensitivities for things like CP violation, these two trade-offs are, are not so different. It turns out that it might take us for things like CP violation approximately, you know, the, the, the same amount of time. Um, so yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, I had a question. Like uh, when this uh, neutrino interact with any force, then is there any changes in their helicity or chirality? Um, so, I mean, so, so, so far there's only, uh, you know, left-handed neutrinos. We don't know of any right-handed neutrinos. Um, so in the standard model, they're always, uh, who's left-handed. Now, if extra neutrinos, so the whole point of, of being able to describe neutrino masses is that if other extra neutrinos existed that we don't know about yet, they could be right-handed. So the interactions themselves don't change um, the, the handedness, but if extra neutrinos existed, they could have a different, they could be right-handed neutrinos and they could have, they would have different, um, uh, yeah, different quality. And do they show the Casimir effects? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't think so. Because they interact via the weak force. Uh, yeah, and during the virtual particles, that could be a possible way yeah, to yeah. sort them out 
Uh, instead of using the plates, we can use a spear. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. Uh, I'd have to think about that one a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I had a question about the, I'm sorry, please go ahead. Okay, I'll go. I had a question about the, the simulation of the beams. So, so how sophisticated do the simulations need to be of these neutrino beams, especially accounting for, for matter effects? Or is there diminishing returns with the simulation? And, and for the precision you need, they don't need to be very involved. No, that's, that's exactly one of the big challenges in upcoming experiments. I mean, so far they've been, they've been pretty good. Um, but the problem is, I mean, <laughs> Neutrinos can interact with nuclei uh, or with protons and, 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 and neutrons um, in, in several ways. Um, they can just scatter off of them. Um, they can, you know, if they're high energy, take something out. Um, and the problem is exactly we don't know the exact distribution, for example, of quarks within protons and, and neutrons. And we don't know the, you know, the exact structure of the atom. It's, it's, it's not we don't know where the hard matter is and where the empty space is. Uh, so one of the biggest problems is exactly simulating this. Um, and, and, and this is also related to one of the biggest systematics um, that are going to be upcoming in, in, in um, the future experiments. But there's experiments that are, that are sort of trying to get at this. So the Minerva experiment, for example, um, they, they deal with you know, shooting different particles to try and map a little bit what the actual inside structure of an atom looks like. So we hope that we can reduce the uncertainties on, um, on you know, what the inside of atom looks like and hence by improve our simulations um, and, and hopefully reduce the uncertainties related to, to the simulations. Um, but yeah, certainly modeling these things is, is is, is one of the bigger issues, especially when you take into account how it interacts with matter and the internal structure of, of atoms and where quarks are actually placed uh, within protons and neutrons and things like this. But hopefully improving after a few more experimental inputs like from Minerva. Are there any additional questions for Professor Illich? Oh, yeah. I had a confusion, like, uh, when this oxygen oxidation happens, so is that uh, totally random or this is any kind of such pattern that observed, like, one passes through electron neutrino to, like, muon to tau, it is just, like, random. Um, no, it's not random. Um, it, it has like, depending from what mass state to which mass state it's going to, um, it has a higher probability than others. So electron neutrinos, um, you know, will more often oscillate to muon neutrinos and tau neutrinos and so on. So there, there's the, when it's oscillating, it oscillates into some flavors with higher probability. And whether it oscillates or not, mostly depends on how far it oscillates uh, or how far it travels, basically.